All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team here? And this is BXJS Weekly, episode 16. Apologies for the delay. I really wanted to stream that yesterday, but the party got a bit out of hand. So um, here we are today doing this right now. Let me just make sure that, yeah, it seems to be working just fine. So we got um, a really, like, tons of articles today and a bit of releases and slightly less demos, I guess, um, and some silly stuff. Uh, to end this thing up but uh, you know as usual let's start with the articles and just go um, along so first thing we got today is uh, Quokka JS rapid prototyping playground if you never heard of Quokka this is a really good introduction to it um, it is a pretty cool um, essentially REPL uh, that lives right in your um, VS code or Atom or whatever you can imagine I think there's like a lot of Oh yeah, okay, so it's available for VS Code Atom and JetBrains. If you never used it, I highly recommend it because it's really great to test the snippets of code and uh, figure out you know, if the thing that you think would work actually works and stuff like this. Um, God, let me try to read your username. I am still not completely out from the party, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, hello, Imler Imlerich, is that correct, Imler Imlerich? I'm, I'm, is it? I'm Le Rich for reals. <laughs> is that how you read it? <laughs> okay. Um, hello, welcome to the stream. <laughs> All right, let us continue here. But yeah, Quokka, like I have it installed in VS Code and it's immensely useful for trying out um, snippets of code. So if you never tried it and if you haven't heard about it, this article gives a pretty good introduction and definitely do give it a shot. Right, continuing, we got an article from Mr. Cansey Dodds called Dealing with FOMO, which is a fear of missing out, right? Um, not strictly JavaScript, but I think highly relevant for a lot of developers because, well, fear of missing out is a thing that is quite common among the developers and just about any other profession that has the, you know, related to things that develop really quick, like technology, for example. And, there's, especially in JavaScript world, there's always something new, always new hype technology, like, you know, ReasonML or second React or whatnot. And there's like 2 billion different libraries coming out. And how do you keep up with all of that? Well, the truth is you don't really have to, right? And this article talks about where does this uh, fear comes from, how to manage it, and that it's actually okay not to care too much about all of those things. It's good to learn new things, but you don't really have to as long as you do your job, right? So that's not something that is extremely important. So do not be afraid of missing out. Uh, hey, Anku, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got a pretty extensive article tutorial uh, that is titled How to Test a Socket IO Client App Using Jest and React Testing Library. And it is exactly what you would imagine. It's a very, very, very thorough tutorial on testing socket IO stuff with Jest and React testing library. So as you can see here, it is very, very big with a lot of uh, code snippets and uh, some quite silly conversations between the author and uh, Mr. Kenzie Dodds, who is the author of the React testing library, right? So if you are working on a WebSocket based library that uses socket IO, I guess it will work just as fine with uh, pure WebSockets. I mean, obviously you wouldn't have the mocking tools from socket IO, but that can be easily replaced. So if you're in need of testing WebSockets, do have a look up, uh, I guess, WebSockets with React in this case, right? Because we are talking React testing library. Um, do have a look at this article. It does gives you a pretty good um, tutorial for basically doing that from scratch. All right, continuing, we got a Web Fundamentals article from the Google developers called Using JavaScript Modules on the Web. It is also a very, very big article as it tends to be from, you know, from the Google uh, developers guys. And it talks about the... ES modules, which is the new ones, right? How they work, how they are uh, used, what kind of, how do you use them in the browsers? How do you do fallbacks? How do you do optimizations and so on and so forth? Um, there's also like talk about the importance of performance, importance of bundling. The thing is, you know, if you look at that, you will see that, well, uh, even though, you know, we have nice ES modules that are really easy to import right now, 
it's a good idea to bundle anyway because it will save you 150 milliseconds, which <laughs> which is like I mean, come on, it's like four times faster, right? So this is this some um, I mean, as usual, it's a really thorough and really great article, and if you are not extremely familiar with the topic, it's a good read. And even if you are there, you will probably find something you didn't know in here. Okay, continuing, we got introducing teleport over the air hot reloading and debugging for progressive web apps. Um, it's a essentially announcement for the new tool that is tailored to help you debug your progressive web apps. And as you can see here, there's a small GIF that uh, shows off what you can actually do with it. Um, it actually is really cool. So essentially you can control um, your progressive web app demo on any other platform using a simple um, thing that you have, right? Uh, and it includes like code reloading, debugging, airwaves, and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, also zero config as usual. So I really like the trend of zero config in JavaScript community lately. Uh, or I guess I uh, wouldn't call it zero config, it's more like sensible defaults, right? Because you have configs anyway, it's just you don't have to configure them most of the time. And there's also a pretty big uh, video from ngconf that explains how this whole thing works. So if you're interested in more details, do have a look. Um, I believe it works with just about anything. Uh, to tell us all your JavaScript secrets. I mean, I don't really have any JavaScript secrets. Most of the stuff I do is actually on GitHub. So <laughs> sorry to disappoint you here. All right, let's continue. Um, oh yeah, this one is one of my favorites of the week, I think. It's um, actually a series of articles, React Native at Airbnb. There is five parts, I think. So there is, yes, exactly, five parts. And um, it is a very in like very detailed write up from the Airbnb fellows on why they decided to switch from uh, React Native to the purely native technology. Why, um, like how did they find React Native? Was it any good? And why did they decide to switch uh, after all the you know years that they actually experimented with it? And uh, it is really interesting to read because it's not, uh, you know, it's not a bashing piece. They don't say that React Native is terrible and that's why we switched. They actually give you a very valid arguments on why the Airbnb was not a good fit or I guess the React Native was not a good fit for creating Airbnb app. And there's also like the organizational challenges and the team related stuff and learnings that they picked up from react native so if you are considering react native or if you're already working with it definitely highly recommend it to read through all of those five articles because there is some really really valuable insights in them i don't know what i'm talking about well neither do i so you know we're all good here <laughs> all right let's continue um New article from Microsoft guys, uh, improved JavaScript and WebAssembly performance in HHTML 17. So I believe um, H17 will be rolled out quite soon. Uh, yes, in April, wait, that, that was, wait, wait, wait a second. Rolls out, wait, it says rolls out, but then April update. April update have been uh, quite some time. Hey, um, man, I can never read your username correctly. Hello, Samohov Samohovitz, is that? <laughs> I'm trying to pronounce it in Russian, but I'm not sure. Um, welcome to the stream. Um, have you looked into Flutter? What's your thoughts on it? I have looked into Flutter. It looks interesting, but I, like, I don't know. I, have, I haven't tried it, uh, like I haven't built anything with it yet. So it's, it's on my backlog, basically. It looks very, like, very interesting and the IDE looks really cool. So I do want to try it. It also looks like JavaScript a lot. So, you know, I like that part definitely. Right, uh, but coming back to the article, it seems like they say it rolls out at part of, Windows 10 April update, but April was like, what, half a year ago already? And it's like, we a bit weird, it, whatever. So basically, <laughs> Edge 17, which is, by the way, Edge is a really decent browser nowadays. So it's like, especially if you're using the mobile Windows devices and don't want to burn through your battery like crazy, because I mean, Chrome tends to do this, Firefox sadly tends to do this. Edge actually does an incredible job of keeping keeping your battery alive and it supports extensions so you can get like, um, uh, what do you call it? The U-Block and u -mate I don't remember if U-Matrix is there, but U-Block is definitely there. So they've optimized and there's like a bunch of performance improvements uh, with JavaScript and um, WebAssembly. 
memory footprint, uh, bytecode refactoring for regular expressions. As you can see, there is some really, really, really um, crazy optimizations. I mean, look at this, it's almost twice this, the improvement in size, right? Uh, faster JavaScript built-ins, I mean, okay, come on. They like they optimize the engines um, forever, and this is a good thing, right? Because we get competition and every time one of the engines says, hey, we're now faster than the other guys. So the other guys go like, wait a second. And that's great to see. So it's always awesome to see um, the sort of improvements being done. It's also really cool to see that actually people started working, or I guess the engine guys started working on WebAssembly performance improvements because it hasn't been out for that long yet. And it's just, you know, started to get traction now and there's not that much content made with it yet. But we're already getting to the point where um, developers are actually trying to make it more optimized, faster, better, and so on and so forth, which is really cool to see. Um, yes, the stream was running for basically five minutes. I talked through like four articles yet, so you are not too late. All right, let's continue. We got the next article, which is called Vue.js, the good, the meh, and the ugly, which is essentially an opinion piece about the experience of one of the developers work with Vue.js and you know why he find that it's good why he thinks that it's meh and why he thinks that the some things are basically bad right but it's not actually not the view itself for example he complains a lot about UX, which is a completely different library for view which is developed by the core team i believe but still is a completely standalone thing so you don't you're not uh, bleh. it's not like you're forced to use it basically but you know if you were considering Vue.js or if you just want to get in, it's a pretty interesting piece to read and see what kind of problems uh, and what kind of advantages does it have. I personally used Vue.js in more than one project and I really like it, uh, especially for like the smaller demos where you, you know, you don't have to set up any compilation or whatnot because you can just throw in it in a script tag and it will work. So if you haven't tried it, do give it a shot because it is pretty cool. All right, continuing, we got reasons to love just the test framework. Again, opinion piece about Jest and uh, why it's great. Uh, you know, you might know that I am a big fan of Jest and I use it in most of my projects, if not all. I don't remember if I migrated the older ones, but this is definitely my current uh, testing framework of choice. And um, this article basically goes through the points that are, well, I say I agree with most of them. It's, yeah, it's definitely have zero config, although it's highly configurable and you can make it work with just about anything. It's quite fast. And this is one of the amusing points because if you ever tried Jest like a couple of years ago when it was, you know, the older versions, I think was like 13 or 12 or whatever, it was extremely slow, but nowadays it's just blazing fast and I'm, I'm just absolutely love it. Um, yes, you can extend it and there's a lot of really cool things, including the official code modes that help you uh, fix things. So if you never tried Jest, then do have a look at this article, uh, read about it and try it out. Um, hey, Grishrock, welcome to the stream. I hope I pronounce your username correctly. <laughs> All right, next thing we got is another article from Google developers. This time around, it is uh, reduced JavaScript payloads with tree shaking. This is essentially an introduction to the tree shaking, what it is, how it works, and how it helps you actually when you build your own code. And you know what I'm thinking? I should probably disable notifications for a couple of hours before they start popping out. Right. Uh, so yeah, this is tree shaking uh, explanations. Very, again, very in-depth one as it usually tends to be with the Google developers articles. So if you're not familiar with it, do have a read through. Um, it talks about... Um, you know, how kind of, first of all, how it works, and second of all, where to apply it, what are the opportunities for it, and uh, how you should kind of tailor your code and tailor your tooling around the possibilities of reducing the size of it with tree shaking, right? So if you're interested, again, in, I guess, code optimization, size optimizations, do have a look, this is a pretty good article. Right, continuing, we got introducing the single element pattern. Um, a bit weird for me actually to, um, or I guess this article was a bit weird to read, right? So the idea of the single element pattern is that you have a React or Preact or whatever view class that always have one element, right? And then if you have more than one, it's kind of bad. 
there is reasoning behind it. There's like a pretty thorough explanation of um, how it works, what kind of questions should you answer, what kind of rules do you have to follow. But I honestly find it slightly weird. And by the way, this make it work and make it better is not finished. There's a third step, which is make it fast, right? So I, I was reading through it and you know, all of those things make sense, but then I look at this card component and I think like, okay, so how would you do that in one element? You can't, right? So the author suggests splitting it into like having like separate avatar, having separate title, separate description, but then you have to assemble this card somewhere else, right? So it's a bit, uh, I don't know, slightly weird. There are some really good advices like, you know, never break the app, for example, this is a really good one. And there's a bunch of uh, ways you can do that. So first one is obviously you can, you know, check for the fields to actually exist. And second one, you can actually use the prop types to validate it and, see, and enforce it and say, hey, it's actually required. So unless you provide it, I won't render and the React will throw warnings, right? Um, it's, yeah, so there's like also stuff like render past attributes as props. I guess it makes sense if you do it with one element, but again, I'm not 100% convinced that this is the best approach. But anyway, it's really interesting to read. So if you are writing a lot of components and working a lot with um, HTML components and so on and so forth, do have a look at this post. There is definitely some interesting thoughts in it and some thoughts that are well arguable, let's put it this way. But uh, still, you know, thought, uh, thought, uh, thought provoking. So that's always great. Right, continuing, we got upgrading to node eight has significantly reduced our operating costs. A pretty interesting write up that uh, the company basically just by upgrading from node six to node eight, which is, you know, the current LTS version, reduced the infrastructure server costs by almost 40% just because of the upgrades. And this just shows how much work goes into V8 and to Node.js and to the optimizations made for it. So it's, it's really insane when you look at the concrete numbers and a specific comparison between versions and some on, on a real world app, right? Not just some esoteric tests that, you know, run hello world two million times or whatever, but actual real apps that work on the real servers. And then you just upgrade the node version and you get like 40% improvement. Like, holy shit, look at that. Um, there's some more in detail write down obviously here on what happened, how it worked, how it's basically changed. So if you're interested, do have a look and what their app is as well, because you know, you cannot really think about improvements in vacuum. You have to know the, uh, what the app actually did. But uh, yeah, if you're interested in stuff like this, it's a pretty good article to have a look. All right, continuing, we got how JavaScript works, the internals of Shadow DOM, plus how to build self-contained components. Essentially an introduction to Shadow DOM. Uh, if you never heard of it, um, Shadow DOM is one of the newer additions to HTML, I guess, right? So the web components is based on the Shadow DOM, right? So you can build a thing that will be contained within its own tiny Shadow DOM that is non related to anything in the document itself. So you can like use CSS inside JavaScript inside and it will be contained within that shadow DOM. So this article goes into a pretty lengthy explanation into what the shadow DOM is, how it works, how do you compose it? How do you use it? And then how do you write the uh, web components essentially using the shadow DOM. So if you were interested in this kind of stuff, do have a look. I would say that um, if you want to write web components, that there are better ways than doing it yourself from scratch, because there is a lot of very annoying low level things that you have to do yourself in this case. And there are existing frameworks that basically make it way easier, like Polymer, for example, or I think there is even tools that compile React, Preact, and Angular components to the web components if you want it, right? So there are definitely better ways of doing it than doing it from scratch. But nonetheless, knowing how to do it from scratch is quite important because, you know, then it, that means you understand all the um, underlying te technology and all the underlying work required to do that. And if something goes wrong, you can figure out why it did. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff to have a look really, really detailed article once again, uh, with a lot of very interesting things and, uh, yeah, definitely worth read. All right, continuing, we got a Node.js guide for front-end developers. Uh, just as you imagine from title, this is essentially a tutorial that gives a short introduction to what Node.js is for people who are working in the front-end. There's a bunch of um, strange things here. I mean, mostly it's kind of 
interesting but uh what i found a bit weird is that first of all i expected you know if you're writing a front end you probably know what the callbacks are right so you i guess you don't know the callback style but uh i feel like the front end took that callback style as well since like the notes um creation times i guess so uh, event loop is obviously also something that front-end developers should be familiar with. It might be slightly different within the browser than in Node.js because, you know, we have, like, I mean, it's not actually that different, right? Because it's just the modules and the user land are different, meaning that you have the file system and all that kind of stuff. But the event loop is the same. So it's, it's um, I guess, I mean, I guess it's interesting to talk about it anyway, right? So um, event emitters, again, something that is in front end. So I'm not sure why it requires a separate section about it. Streams are definitely something that, um, yes, nodes best and most misunderstood idea. This is definitely something I uh, agree with. Do you have a newsletter or a website with all those links? Yes, I do have a website. There is no newsletter, but you can find all those links on the GitHub. There should be a link in the channel description or um, on YouTube, it's in uh, the video description, but there is a link below in the channel description. You can just click on it and there will be an episodes.markdown file with all the links. So yeah, okay, continuing, uh, we got, yeah. So basically, you know, if you are a front-end dev and you want to learn about Node, this is a quite good starting point. Uh, some arguable things, but you know. Okay, continuing, we got building your first serverless app in Node.js with AWS Lambda S3 and API Gateway. Um, very extensive tutorial on essentially, yes, as, as it said, building your first serverless app using Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services is an incredible tool set and provides you with 200 million services that can allow you to do basically anything you want. But it takes like weeks to learn what the hell is that stuff and how to use it, right? They do have quite decent documentation, but just because of the sheer amount of services that Amazon provides, it's sometimes really hard to get started actually. So this article, and as you can see here, it's really, really big. It goes through a basic tutorial on how to use the um, Amazon Lambda, which is the function service, right? So it's the functions executed executed on demand, on request, with API gateway and S3 buckets for data storage and how to combine all of that together to make your first serverless app. So it, it goes along with the screenshots of the AWS config uh, because, I mean, come on, let's be honest, AWS control panel is not very easy to understand as well. So if you're looking to get into a serverless world, then do have a look at this article. It does give you a pretty good introduction to at least Amazon Web Services stuff. Because if you want to build it in Google Cloud or Azure, then well, good luck. You're going to have to, you know, re, re how do you, how, how to put it? Not to relearn actually, but to adapt half of the things you know about Amazon into Azure or Google Cloud because their user interfaces are entirely different and they call things completely differently at some places. So it can be a bit of a pain. All right, continuing, we got uh, building a Facebook Messenger chatbot with Node.js, a tutorial on building, as you might imagine, Facebook Messenger chatbots uh, using Node. So it's quite simple, right? So you just, uh, the author uses Express.js with body parser. Um, I'm not sure why um, does he need the workaround for HTTPS. So the, I think Facebook enforces the um, HTTPS right now. So you have to actually provide the HTTPS URL. Author uses this uh, ngrok tool for that, but I think there's actually a better way. So I think Express now has the Let's Encrypt module that you can just plug in, but you know, whatever works essentially. Um, then yeah, so the, uh, if you didn't know, Facebook bots uh, mostly work with uh, webhooks. So you just essentially set up a webhook, re register it with uh, Facebook and then handle the request and reply it in uh, any way you want. So if you were looking to build a simple uh, Facebook chat bot, do have a look at this article. It does explain quite a lot of uh, at least basic things that you have to do, the basic setup, the basic message answering, so on and so forth. And uh, there's a small video demo over here. Just maybe mute the sound because I don't think we need it. So, you know, you can ask for cats and dogs and it will actually give you a cat or a dog. So pretty straightforward. 
Right, continuing, we got how to make beautiful, simple command line apps with Node.js. Um, again, tutorial, opinionated tutorial, let's put it this way, because it does talks about some of the command line packages that I, for example, didn't know about. I've never even heard about them, but they are seem to be pretty good. Um, starting from the execa, which is a better child process, essentially, uh, and going to the uh, lister and other things that basically allow you to build a very nice looking command line interaction tool, right? So um, if you were looking to build something like this, do have a look there is, I mean, it's pretty simple, but it does give you a starting point, right? So yeah, continuing, we got end to end testing, a sim single page application with um, a Node.js API with Cucumber and Puppeteer. So Again, tutorial, and this one is really, really, really big and really detailed. Uh, and I mean, come on, end-to-end -end testing is always a pretty tricky topic because there is a lot of um, things you have to set up, you have to know, you have to figure out, especially if you work with single page apps. And this tutorial essentially uh, consists of two parts, or I guess three parts. First one is explanation of what the Cucumber.js is and how do you use it. So it's like, there is quite a lot of code snippets here as well, and you know, what exactly you do, exactly you set it up, and so on and so forth, how it works. Second part is what the puppeteer is. Again, how do you set it up? How do you use it? And so on and so forth. And then the last part is integrating uh, those two and using them together to actually test your single page application and ExpressJS API. So if you are working on something like this, do have a look. This is a very extensive and a pretty good guide on using both. All right, continuing, we got uh, WebAssembly and Go, a look to the future. Last episode, we talked that the Golang just landed the WebAssembly support into Go 111, right? They haven't shipped Go 111 publicly yet. You can compile it from the repository, obviously. It's not yet uh, released, but people already started playing with it, started trying it and started uh, checking out what you can do. So this is, uh, I believe, a blog of the Go developer who looked at the um, WebAssembly, who looked at the, compared it with um, Go4JS, which was Go to JavaScript compilation, and gave his thoughts about what WebAssembly will bring to the web, right? So this basically is a summary of the post is that there was Rails, there was Go, there was Docker, and then WebAssembly is going to democratize front end. Um, and then he predicts that in two years, blah, 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 like uh, lower level languages will be one third of the front end code. So here's the, uh, like, I'm depending on what do you mean by democratized front end, I have a slightly different um, thoughts about it. So I think that actually instead of democratizing front end or uh, WebAssembly is going to empower JavaScript even more, and we're going to see more JavaScript than ever in a couple of years. Because right now JavaScript has a bunch of bottlenecks, right? So we have things like machine learning that you cannot, I mean, you can do it in JavaScript now and largely thanks to the WebAssembly and uh, WebGL and all that kind of stuff, but it's still, it's not as efficient, right? But the more the engines develop the WebAssembly, the more support it gains within the Go, Swift, Rust, whatever we can imagine the more low level libraries we're gonna see for JavaScript. And there will be less and less reason to actually write anything else, right? You can just take the library, compile it to JavaScript and then, or I guess WebAssembly and then use it from JavaScript. So uh, while I do think that we're gonna see a lot of code in front end that is built from other languages, I still think that the JavaScript is gonna be dominating the programming scene even more. At least that's my prediction. So we're gonna see how that goes. But anyways, uh, interesting perspective from a Golang developer. Do have a look at it. There's some interesting thoughts in here. Also, I don't think there was a quite big discussion somewhere. Was it in Hacker News or something? But, uh, you know, if you want it, you will find it yourself. Right, continuing. Uh, we got another React Native piece. Should we use React Native? This is from the co-founder of Expo. If you are not familiar with it, um, Expo is a really cool tool uh, for React Native development and what you essentially uh, create when um, when you when you um, create React Native app. The first project you will be how do you put it? The first project that will be bootstrapped will be Expo project actually, not the React Native itself. It's a really cool tool that allows you to um, 
quickly set up apps and then also try those apps right in the browser. So Expo allows you to just run the emulator in the browser and uh, we are like for free accounts, there is a small queue, but which is, you know, not completely terrible. Um, but it's really cool that you can do that. You can also download the Expo client on iOS or Android and then run those apps with a hot reload and everything directly on your phone, which is a great tool basically. And um, this post talks about this uh, whole React Native thing and the Airbnb, specifically because of Airbnb article and Airbnb sunsetting the React Native development, talks about, you know, okay, React Native is actually not bad. It's actually a really good technology. And if you read the post from Airbnb, you would say, you would see that they say that React Native is great, but it's just not a good fit for Airbnb. Just as with, you know, any other technology, if it's not a good fit for you, you're not going to use it. And uh, then there are some pointers here on whether, um, how do you basically decide whether you should use React Native or not, including uh, sort of, you know, do you have existing app? What's kind of, what kind of developers do you have? Because people who write for iOS or Android and, you know, like Java guys or Swift guys, um, they might not like JavaScript, right? So let's be honest, not everyone likes JavaScript syntax and uh, some people are traumatized by JavaScript syntax like 10 years ago and still hate it. So it's, you know, there, there can be some social traction essentially, but um, it is a pretty good write up and um, do have a look if you are exploring again, React Native and trying to figure out if you should use it. Right, continuing, we got connecting competing microservices using RabbitMQ. So this is a tutorial on, well, scalability, I guess is what they say, but essentially load balancing uh, microservices using MQP and RabbitMQ specifically, right? So if you never worked with MQP message queues, uh, subscribers and stuff like this, you can read through this article, you will get the basic gist of it. And you also get the basic sort of source code, you know, uh, using M MQP simple pops up, which is the abstraction over the MQP lib itself. So we can uh, go lower level than that. And uh, yeah, it will essentially teach you how to do competing services that will listen to the um, requests on the same topic. And we'll load balance. So RabbitMQ automatically load balances the messages depending on how you set it up. I guess they set it up with a topic exchange, right? Yeah, it seems so. Um, it is quite interesting. So if you never work with uh, RabbitMQ, that's pretty good introduction. RabbitMQ is awesome. If you didn't know it, it's used in a lot of um, enterprises. I mean, Google uses it and so on and so forth, right? So uh, it's a really great technology for a lot of really cool things. Um, Obviously, I have to talk about Kafka, of course, because <laughs> Kafka is all the trendy things now. Um, but yeah, uh, like good intro to Rabbit, good intro to using Node.js with Rabbit, and some interesting tips in here. So if you never read about any of those technologies, that's a good starting point. If you have, you probably won't really find anything uh, new in here. All right, continuing, we got building a JavaScript single page application without a framework. As you can see, there's a really, really, really big article um, on how to build a single page application from scratch without using any libs or anything like that. So you will have your own server, you will have your own HTML, and then you will write your own client side routing, you will write your own page changes and history and all that kind of stuff, right? So if you are interested into how the single page application frameworks work, well, this article essentially guides you through building one of your own. So um, really great write up, um, a lot of really good codes, well documented and explained. So if you are curious how the single page app frameworks work, or maybe just wanted to build your own for whatever reason, do have a look, this will give you a good starting point. Right, continuing, we got building a serverless Slack bot using Cloudflare workers. So we talked about the Cloudflare workers uh, quite a long time ago, actually, five or six episodes ago, they presented it. And uh, the idea is that you can run service workers on Cloudflare Edge, right, and make them sort of Cloudflare workers, essentially, without any servers and so on and so forth. So the cool idea is that you can, or cool thing, I guess, is that you can use those workers to create a Slack bot because once again, Slack bots use um, web hooks, which means you can configure your worker to handle that web hook and to reply to it. And then again, 
then it's just JavaScript, right? Parse the message, make the API request, and so on and so forth. Uh, pretty cool application, I guess. So if you were curious about what you can actually do with the Cloudflare workers, or maybe you're already using Cloudflare and wanted to extend uh, the functionality, do have a look. There's some really neat tips here. And uh, well, yeah, good code example that shows you how you can actually use that. All right, continuing, we got introducing Akita, new state management pattern for Angular applications. Um, to try to re um, like a new library, obviously, yes, uh, called Akita that tries to rethink the concept of uh, state management for Angular apps. I will be honest and I will um, tell you that I have not had time to look into the thing itself. So Akita itself, I, I mean, I haven't worked with Angular in like three years, I think. So it is a bit hard for me to know what the hell is going on there. I know that they used RxJS, the, um, the, the Akita seems also to use it. So they used the NGRx as the store and so on and so forth, right? And um, this one seems to basically merge the existing store management with something like GraphQL. At least this is what I gathered from the, uh, the article itself, because they talk about the, the fact that you have models and then you have the store and then you have those sort of uh, queries, right? Where you ask the store to do something with the query, which uh, seems to be, at least from my opinion, seems to be very GraphQL inspired. I might be misunderstanding the whole thing from the article, because as I said, I did not have enough time to look in the API, but if you're working with Angular, then do have a look, maybe you'll find it's better than the current solutions or maybe not. Do let me know if you work with Angular, if you check this out, uh, share your comments and thoughts with me, we'll be really interested to hear if it's any good. All right, continuing. A minimal guide to ECMAScript decorators. Uh, yeah, those were around for ages. So if you didn't know ECMAScript decorator is something that was proposed uh, for ECMAScript 2015, I think, very first one. And I think they are still on stage two. Um, is it correct? There was a stage written here. They are in stage two, yes. So there was like a lot of a lot of problems with them and they moved from like strawman to proposal and then I think back to strawman and then back to proposal and now it's in the draft stage, finally. There's been a lot of issues related to them, but essentially decorator is, um, is a wrapping function. So if you look at it in you know the stupidest way, it's actually, uh, there should be a snippets of code somewhere here. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, the article does goes into pretty in-depth explanation of what the hell decorators are and how they worked. But uh, if you look at the very basic case, like right here, yeah. So the decorator is actually just a function call upon the either property or a class or other function or whatnot, right? And they can be very powerful, but they are also pretty tricky to land in JavaScript apparently, right? That's why we, um, they are been in development for the past, what, three years, just the spec itself. And there's like been a ton of changes to it. So um, anyway, it's a really interesting um, write up on what the decorators are, how they work, quite in depth as I said. Um, so if you did know about them, if you wanna learn more about them, since they are at draft stage, there is, I'm hoping there won't be any major changes anymore. It seems like they finally figured everything out and uh, moving them forward. So we're gonna see how that goes. But that's really great write up. Do have a look at it. All right, continuing we got GitHub stars are not equal usage. React is still blowing Vue and Angular away. Oh yeah, this is, <laughs> I thought about including this whole debate from Twitter last week uh, into the previous episode of BXGS, but I was like, okay, whatever, let's just skip it. But uh, no, now there's an article, so why not? Let's talk about it. So um, last week, the Vue.js has passed React in star count. Does it actually mean anything? Not really, because star counts on GitHub doesn't really mean anything, right? It's just people liking stuff. It was like, hey, Vue.js passed React in likes. Does that mean anything? Not really. It's really cool that, you know, they have that many stars and all the props to them. I mean, the Vue.js is great technology, but um, stars don't really mean anything, right? It's like, if you look at the downloads per month, for example, from React, React is dominating everything. Like not even Angular is coming close to the volumes of usage in terms of, in volumes of downloads, I guess, right? He has a comparison with Angular included. It's like, 
React just blown it away and it's been, it's still rising it seems. So, you know, do not judge the projects by the amount of stars they have, please. That is not, not very objective. Let's, let's just be frank. All right, continuing, we got uh, building our, our uh, building, shouldn't it be an RSS viewer? Uh, building RSS viewer with view part one. So this is a two part article. Uh, the second part is already published and link is here um, about building your own RSS reader using Vue.js. And I believe they're using um, Express.js, was it? Um, so RSS parser for parsing RSS. I mean, it's a pretty famous module. Um, Pretty good write up. I mean, it's it's very high level. So there's no like, you know, very in depth, very low level things here. But if you ever wanted to do your own RSS reader or just wanted to see how it's done, then this one is a pretty good starting point at least. And uh, I mean, the reader itself is quite basic here, but you know, you will get um, at least a starting point. Right, continuing, we got trouble with D3JS. Um, sort of, I guess not opinion, it's more of a thought piece talking about D3JS and why some people complain about it and what are the kind of, why is it so hard to work with it? Because even though D3JS is an incredibly powerful tool, it might not be that easy to understand, right? And I think there is like, yeah, this image sums it up pretty well. So D3JS API, it basically has everything. and. There's another image that shows it really well is uh, this one. Because if you didn't know D3JS has DOM APIs, this is basically like jQuery. It has a data utilities that is basically like Lodash, like not complete Lodash, but you know, quite a lot of it actually. Then it has the animation, analysis, data visualization, and geolocation APIs, and all of that is in one library. So it's not a surprise that a lot of people find it intimidating or high to, uh, not high, or hard to learn, right? So. But um, this article talks about, you know, all of that stuff, uh, tells you what you should look at and gives you some pointers on how to actually start it, including the Hitchhiker's Guide to D3, which is actually amazing. And you should read it if you want to do data viz with D3GS. But yeah, you know, it's a pretty good article to get started with D3, I guess, I guess and uh, to basically evaluate and see what kind of things you might encounter while working with it. All right, continuing, we got writing your own ESLint plugins, a tutorial on writing uh, plugins. Um, pretty straightforward, it uses the Yeoman generator, uh, generator ESLint, which is, I think it's still official one. Um, quite straightforward, but does talks, I mean, it's very high level, but does talks about the testing and AST Explorer that will help you to figure out your code snippets and so on and so forth, because I mean, ESLint does work with um, AST most of the time, right? So you have to understand that part. Um, it's more of a high level overview of how to start, I guess. But um, if you ever wanted to do your own plugin, then this could be a nice starting point. Definitely make sure to look at the ESLint uh, docs because they do have some good writes up there too. I don't know if this article links to them. I don't believe they did anywhere. No, don't think so, but uh, yeah. If you wanted to write your own ESLint rule, do have a look at this. Right, continuing. Here's why mapping a constructed array in JavaScript doesn't work. So if you ever try to do this, you know that it's just not gonna work, right? And at first I was also confused. I was like, why can't I just, you know, create an array of hundred elements and then map by index and just have a, you know, array from one to hundred. That's like a range, right? And it would be nice. No, it doesn't work like this. Well, this article basically goes into quite in-depth explanation of what the hell's happened. And uh, yeah, that all comes down to the keys because when you create the array with links, it just has length. So there's nothing to iterate over. And author also gives a bunch of solutions, including the spread one, which is the probably the simplest one, right? And uh, it's not the only one. Um, there's other ways to do that, but uh, yeah, it's like, it's, it's curious case basically of JavaScript quirks also. Not terrible quirks, but you know, good to know anyway. All right, continuing, we got not strictly JavaScript article, but I think it's quite important to know about uh, techniques like this. Uh, improve your visitors perceived loading speed with primitive art. So this is something that I actually learned while working on mobile apps a lot is that, um, why is it not, I thought, oh, okay, I blocked all the JavaScript again. 
So there is a huge difference of uh, actual loading speed and display speed with the perceived loading speed, right? So users actually don't care about actual speed, right? As long as they feel like it's loading fast enough, they will forgive your long loading times. That's very important on mobiles, for example. And this is why the splash screens on mobiles are so uh, widespread. Because if you just show the loader when you launch the app, people will get annoyed and will close it at some point, right? But if you show a nice fancy loading screen, that will take a couple of seconds to show and then there's a loading image and then there's something happening, people will be more forgiving. And that works more or less the same with all the loading things on the web. So instead of, you know, just showing a white space with a he will be image at some point, you can show the low quality preview generated by the, I don't know, SVG or something, right? And uh, this will increase the perceived loading time. Well, in reality, nothing really changes, right? But the user will see it, hey, it's already here in, in like one second, so hey, it's fast. While in reality, nothing really changed, right? You just put the placeholders in there. And the article goes through the bunch of techniques that you can actually use to do that. So from the uh, uh, SQIP, LQIP, the SVG traces and so on and so forth. So basically there's like a billion of different techniques that you can use for images. And there's including like the tools that you can use for that. And you know, Webpack loaders, Gatsby, Node Wrapper and all that kind of stuff. So if you are interested in making your website uh, seem faster, then this is a pretty good article to have a look at. And I think it's a quite important thing because you know, you always want to make your user feel like everything is fast, even when it's not quite that, right? <laughs> okay, the next thing we got is uh, node actually landed process HR time begins. So, um, the big end support landed in Node.js, right? With the latest V8 being merged. And now you can actually use the HR time begins to um, measure times that are really, really large. So before that, like HR uh, process HR time, you could use that to, um, wait a second, let me open it so that I don't terribly lie to you. Come on, I clicked it. What is happening? There we go. My internet is being slow. Process HR time. Where is it? Um, oh, there we go. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so you can use this to track execution of something, right? Or like timeout or whatever. So like for, I don't know how useful it is for performance testing. I mean, I used it a bunch of times to test like, you know, query execution, for example, because it's not exactly inside of the node itself could be useful. And uh, the problem is that it could be useful uh, the previous time. Like if you wanted more precision, it might have been a problem because it gives you stuff in nanoseconds. And if you wanted higher precision, then you had problems. I believe this thing with the big end now actually solves it. So you can get higher precision because I mean, it's a big end now. And uh, there is, there's not much discussion here actually, but anyway, it's quite interesting to see uh, the big end starting to get used within Node to sort of do things like this, right? Okay, next thing we got is, uh, there is a work in progress started on Node.js to speed up the startup with a V8 code cache, which means that the upon execution, your app will be cached. And next time you start it, if there's nothing changed within the source code, the app start time will actually be improved. As you can see here, there is actually quite significant improvement with uh, uh, even with testing, right? So um, the binary size does increases obviously because you have to add the cache and the um, was like heap is decreased, heap used is decreased as well, which is quite interesting. So yeah, it's it's also like sort of performance improvements, right? And obviously not without the compromises, but still really cool to see that there are things like this being implemented. Right, next thing we, we got is this tweet. Yes, um, you can actually import node modules from data text JavaScript, and then you just put in the text there. And this will be actually considered a proper JavaScript module. So you can actually do that and import the code and it will actually work, which is, Kind of crazy and um, 
works in in all the major browsers that support ES modules and it's like yes don't fuck with javascript because javascript fucks back <laughs> which is i'm i'm not sure how i feel about that but it's quite amusing that you can actually do that <laughs> Okay, continuing, we got, uh, this is something I didn't know. So it's like a more of a tip, I guess. Uh, there is actually a strict mode in a cert module in node where you can just say strict as a cert from a cert or, you know, require a cert strict. And it will always use the strict equal instead of normal equal when you do assertions, which could be useful in quite a lot of situations because I always was annoyed when the strict uh, assert equal was not using the strict equal. So it's quite cool to know. I mean, I probably should take some time and read the whole no docs because there's so many things I just don't know about it. Okay, continuing, we got a pretty extensive discussion here actually about deprecating glamorous in favor of emotion. So those, if you're not familiar, both glamorous and emotion are CSS and JS solutions. Glamorous being the solution from PayPal guys, uh, specifically Ken C. Dots is the lead developer on it and it's actually quite a popular one and uh, there is a really big discussion of whether it should be deprecated or not because they feel like emotion um of course you have to add js because i always want to found it uh they feel like emotion is a better approach than uh, glamorous and this is why they want to deprecate it and just sort of contribute to emotion instead of maintaining their own thing which I guess makes sense, but there's a lot of people who are not exactly happy about that. So it's, um, yeah, it's interesting to see how that will develop. And uh, some comments are also quite insightful. So do make sure to read through the whole discussion. All right, continuing, we got uh, setting up Windows to build and run Node.js applications. So if you are working under Windows, or if you wanted to work under Windows, but didn't know how to set it up properly, then this guide is actually for you. It goes through the um, introduction of a bunch of tools. Scoop, which I didn't know. So there is, is a package manager like Homebrew for Linux. And uh, you might know that there is a Chocolaty, um, yeah, this is basically Choco package manager for Windows, which is quite good, but still sometimes annoying because like you can, you have to run it from admin and so on and so forth. While Scoop doesn't have those negative things and seems to be more uh, modern, I guess, maybe because it was written, uh, you know, in a more modern time. So it doesn't have some of the drawbacks that Choco has. It also talks about setting up like Yarn, OpenSSH, Git, uh, even Windows version of sudo, if you, if you know that exists, uh, using NVM to manage node versions, uh, compiling extensions, what actually, what, what do you need to uh, install? If you didn't know, you can actually get all you need to do uh, to work with the native Windows, uh, sorry, native node extensions in Windows. You can just install it with Node.js. There's the Windows build tools that does everything for you. Basically all you need to do. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty good write up. And if you wanted to set up your own environment, that's a good start. Uh, I would say that I would add Windows uh, Linux subsystem here because this is one of the coolest things. And this brings us to the next video we have here. It is quite long, it's like 50 minutes, but uh, it's a video from the Microsoft Build Conference. And again, it talks through the setting up Windows uh, for dev environment that feels like dollar home. And it talks about the Windows Linux, uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, how it works and what you can do with it. And there's a very, very in-depth look at the whole subsystem. So if you were interested or if you wanted to do that, because I mean, it's just, it's great. Like, right, I have my hyper here, for example, I have VSL installed and uh, this is this is like my Ubuntu, right? So I, I can, it's Linux kernel. Well, okay, modified by Microsoft, which is obvious, but it is an Ubuntu installed here. And the cool thing is that now you can actually have a bunch of uh, different Wait a second, I have to show you. It's just I was, I didn't know about that before I watched the video, but this is really cool. So like, if you look in the uh, Microsoft store, you can actually see there are various Linuxes available. So you can, what you can do is you can install different versions of Linux as a subsystems for Windows. So in my case, I have Ubuntu installed, but if you don't like Ubuntu, you can install Kali or Debian or Suzy or, 
You can even build your own if you want, which is kind of great. As you can see here, I have the Ubuntu installed. So if you wanted to know more about the Windows uh, subsystem for Linux, do have a look at this video. It gives you a pretty in-depth uh, explanation of what it is, how it works, and what you can do with it. Okay, that's actually it for the article section. Now we get to the releases this week. Uh, first release we got is Node version 10.5. Um, not much things... Uh, changed yeah so they added they keep adding begin support to different apis and the major highlight here is worker threads that has been merged into master are now behind the experimental worker flag so you can actually have worker threading in node.js now if you want to it is experimental so may break and may receive breaking changes at any time be careful if you use it but do play around with it it seems pretty cool i have not tried it myself yet i should change that Okay, next thing we got is V8 point, uh, sorry, V8 version 6.8 uh, released, which basically comes with a ton of uh, performance optimizations for just about everything. And is it tends to be the optimizations are insane when you look at those charts, especially like this, you know, type trades with integer are, what is it, like three times more efficient now, which is kind of insane. Uh, again, WebAssembly improvements and uh, some V8 uh, API changes, I believe. Uh, but, you know, always cool to see the new V8 versions. Uh, really excited to see where all of that leads and uh, how, how, how fast can we make WebAssembly go, basically, right? Um, all right, next thing we got is Electron 3.0 Beta 1. So the major things being upgrades to the Latest Chrome, latest Node, and latest V8 being 6.6. Um, again, not the bleeding edge ones that we have, but still quite a welcome improvement because the versions of those have been lagging behind quite a bit. Uh, but yeah, really exciting to see that, you know, Electron keeps developing. Um, I wouldn't say after Microsoft acquisition because they probably even haven't finalized yet, but still, you know. All right, next thing we got is Atom 1.28. Um, minor release, it seems to be mostly to update the underlying stuff. Um, again, GitHub package improvements that are kind of like, okay, yeah. Uh, the major improvements seem to be the Electron upgrade uh, that, that is finally upgraded to Electron version 2.0, which brings the Node 8 and Chromium 61, which is always great. There are as well some additional things like finding project uh, improvement for results and support for custom color profiles and stuff like this, you know, still not as exciting as VS Code, as I already said more than one time, it's sort of, I'm, <laughs> it's always a bit boring to read those re, uh, release notes in comparison to VS Code stuff. Okay, next release we got is Billboard JS 150, which is pretty cool. They've added the radar type diagram. Uh, if you didn't know about the Billboard JS, it is a really cool library that is built upon D3.js that gives you a very nice abstraction uh, when you don't need, you know, the low level control with just one nice chart. This basically gives you a collection of really simple and straightforward charts that you can uh, create in literally like a couple of lines. Mm, come on, where was my examples? Uh, yeah, this is literally all you need, right? You just say generate and it's a type bar chart and there's the my data. So that's all you need to do. It's very simple, very straightforward, and very easy to use. Uh, again, not super customizable because it's essentially presets, but if you need customizable, you go for D3.js. If not, then just use billboards, um, which now provides even more things, uh, you know, as like, yeah, a ton of improvements and a ton of other cool things. Right, continuing, we got Winston 3.0. So this was one of my favorite loggers that I've been using in uh, most of my projects. They just released the major version 3.0 after, I don't know, a couple of years, I think, maybe, maybe a year or so. Um, pretty customizable and um, extendable logger that can basically log into everything with transport support. So you can actually log to file, log to console, log to your Elasticsearch instance, whatever, and do it all from one logger. Uh, supporting scopes, levels, and stuff like this. So if you were looking for a um, flexible, extensible logger, do have a look at this one. Um, there's one thing that I'm not sure I like about it. They have this format, new formatting uh, way, which is essentially done with functions now. And if you want pretty printing, you have to actually specify the format for printing yourself, which I found to be slightly weird. I mean, I guess 
I get the idea and it does make it super flexible, but it's just like, you know, you want me to configure things that work nice before without configuration. I'm too lazy for that basically. But yeah, it's uh, still a really good library and uh, do have a look at it if you're looking for extensible logger. Right, next thing we got is Gatsby version two beta launch uh, with quite a lot of things. So if you didn't know, Gatsby is the um, static website generator built um, on React, right, for React. I think it's, yeah, for React, on React. Uh, it's very easy to use. It supports Markdown, whatever you can imagine, and can work with GraphQL and uh, can be deployed to just about anything and has a really good documentation. So if you were looking for a static website generator, do have a look at Gatsby, it might be your kind of thing. The beta build brings quite a lot of improvements, including the latest versions of Babel Webpack and all that kind of stuff. Uh, React 16 as well. Yeah, so, you know, all the good stuff. Okay, next thing is, uh, well, not quite released, but I just found it to be really cool. So I thought I would highlight it. Uh, VS Code in Insiders version, that is like the nightly version essentially for it, just got portable mode. So instead of downloading and installing VS Code, for example, that might be a problem for people who are working on computers where they don't have the admin rights, right? You can now just download a zip and unpack it and just have a portable app, which is always great to have. It's like, you know, you can just carry it around on a USB stick or something. So great to have it. It's going to be shipped on the next uh, release, basically. Right, next thing we got, I think this is our last release, is GitLab 11 with Auto DevOps and license management. They promise Auto DevOps, which is literally Auto DevOps, when you just say, like, you know, tick a box and it does all the DevOps for you, including building, testing, and deploying, which sounds pretty crazy, but I have to try it because it looks fascinating. We also have license management now, which will show you the uh yeah software composition analysis so you show you the licenses for all the external components libraries and so on and so forth and tell you what kind of licenses do you have there and uh what kind of uh included licenses you should include into your own product which is actually a really great tool because it sometimes it can be annoying to do that and uh considering gitlab is an enterprise product above everything right having a this feature integrated into your local GitLab deployment might be pretty cool for enterprises. Okay, that's it for releases. Now we are coming down to the uh, libraries and demos section. And the first library we have is NGX testing library, which is essentially a fork of the React and DOM testing libraries from uh, Mr. Kansi Dots that are adapted for Angular. So if you're working with Angular, do have a look at this one. It might simplify your life quite a bit. Uh, it exactly provides the exact same API as the React testing library and DOM testing library. Seems to be really neat and really nice. And uh, yeah, you know, if you use Angular, do have a look at this one. Okay, continuing, we got hello, Pulu, Pulu. Jesus Christ, hello, Pulu, I guess Pulumi, Pulumi. I have no idea how to pronounce it, but let's just go with Pulumi. A uh, new open source cloud development platform. Uh, as it says, it's a new cloud development platform. The cool thing is that it's actually open source and available on GitHub. So if you want to play around with it, you can just have a look here and try it. It uh, has the components for Amazon, Azure, Google Cloud, Kubernetes, and whatever you can imagine. So it is pretty interesting. It is completely open source. Seems to be written in JavaScript as well, which is also cool. So uh, if you're interested in sort of cloud platforms and maybe you wanted to build your own or just, you know, wanted to find out how to build one, do have a look at this one. It looks pretty neat. Uh, so far, I think it only supports JavaScript, but they are planning to extend the set of stacks and languages uh, later on. Okay. Next thing we got is Animista, CSS animations on demand. This is basically a collection of like a ton of different animations that you can just like, first of all, look, right? So you got different settings and then you say, okay, you know, I like this one, show me the code and you get the code for it, which is kind of great. So if you're looking for a bunch of animations, there's also like entrances, exit, text, attention, uh, yes, vibrate. This is the buttons that jump. This is exactly what we need on the web. Blink. Perfect. Just this is what we want. 
All right, um, next thing we got is Twimoji, the Twitter emoji library that contains 2,841 emojis. I believe they are all in SVG and PNG actually. And uh, you can use them from JavaScript or you can use them within your designs, which is also great. It is all CC by four, uh, which is also cool. And code is licensed under MIT, which is kind of great. I mean, Twitter OSS guys were always uh, quite good with their libraries, I think. So if you need a few thousand of emojis, then have a look here, uh, look no further. All right, next thing we got is ddent. Uh, if you ever work with uh, ES6 strings, you know that sometimes it might be annoying. Like this is how I tend to write my strings, right? But the problem is um, this white space over here will be printed as just as you type it, right? So this is not what you want. And this is exactly what this ddent uh, template tag, or I, how do you call it? Is it a tag? Yeah, it is a tag, right? A string tag that fixes it, right? So it actually removes this indentation and uh, changes it. So, and it seems to be quite smart. So it actually fixes the leading uh, space spaces correctly and will leave persist this formatting, right? So it's uh, pretty cool. So if you are writing a lot of those, do have a look. All right, next thing we got is Raj, Elm architecture for JavaScript. Um, exactly what you would expect from the name. So it's a rewrite of, a, or I guess adaption of Elm architecture to JavaScript. There is quite good documentation on it with a lot of examples and uh, basically explanation of how it works. I don't know if you would want that sort of architecture without Elm itself, but it's anyway interesting to have a look. So if you were curious to have a look, there are some interesting ideas here and there. If you never worked with Elm as well, this is, um, could be a pretty good introduction to the overall architecture of it, not the Elm itself, obviously. Okay, next thing we got is Stream, a UI kit built upon Bootstrap 4. Um, that looks really, really cool. I mean, it's essentially just a UI toolkit, right, with a very fancy button styles and everything built upon Bootstrap 4 with all the templates included and, and stuff like this with the pretty good examples. And uh, I believe it is MIT licensed and completely free. Yes, so there you go. You can just download it and use it even commercially, as they say. So there you go. Maybe you were looking for something like this. Right, next thing we got is MathJS, um, extensive math library for JavaScript and Node.js. I am curious if they are using uh, BigInt right now. Let's see. Um, you know what? I'm just, I mean, I'm just going I'm, <laughs> to, I'm really curious if anyone, no, not yet. Okay, so it doesn't yet use BigInt. But it's anyway pretty cool to see a pure math library um, that you know contains basically most of the things that you would expect from. Oh, they they do have big numbers, powered by decimals JS. Okay, here's a question: Does decimals JS support big int? No, they're not. Okay, not yet. Again, they're probably gonna do it at some point, right? Because it makes sense. Okay, whatever. Let's continue. Next thing we got is SpriteJS, cross-platform lightweight 2D render object model. Exactly what do you expect? It is a library for working with sprites. Um, Tim, why you switched to Windows from Mac? Developing a Mac is easier. I have not switched to Windows. This is my gaming computer. It's just easier to stream from it because I have all this setup and replugging this stuff into the Mac is a bit annoying. So I just stream from it. I do prefer developing on Mac majority of time, although, you know, with the Windows uh, Linux subsystem it's actually not that, the difference is no longer that big. So I'm actually looking into the uh, Surface, the new Surface books that look really cool and I'm considering switching the MacBook to the Surface book. Uh, hey, Dash, welcome to the stream. All right, uh, coming back to the Sprite. So this is, uh, what do you expect? It's a Sprite and Scene Manager and uh, seems to be somewhat, um, what do you call it? Somewhat uh, similar to the, man, what was the name of it? Pixie.js, exactly, this is what I wanna say. Um, not sure how it compares, I have not had time to try it out, uh, but yeah, it looks pretty interesting. So if you're looking for a lightweight sprite manager, that seems to be a good one. Uh, could I ask some JavaScript questions? You can ask JavaScript questions, please go ahead for it. I'm gonna keep reading the news for now, but after I'm done, I will answer all your questions. Okay, next library we got is Rabbit Ear. Um, really cool one, actually. It's a library for uh, designing origami. And as you can see here, you can literally drag it and you will see the final shape like this. 
it has a lot of really nice demos here. So it's not just like one uh, slice, you can actually, you know, do it in more places. And there is some crazy things, including uh, like, yes, editor, origami case patterns. It's really cool. And it's written in JavaScript. So it's pretty nice to see um, you can actually do stuff like this. I believe it's a canvas based. It's actually an interesting question. Yeah, it is canvas based. So there you go. Pretty cool. Right, next thing we got is material dashboards, uh, open source bootstrap for material design admin dashboard that you can adapt to your own code, basically. So this is as far as I understood, this is just the UI and you have to write the logic yourself, but it is available for HTML, React, View, Angular, whatever you want. There is a dashboard, uh, user profiles, tables, maps and notifications. And then you can just, you know, tweak it to the fit your use case. Uh, so if you were looking for something like this, and want to write it yourself do have a look seems to be quite nice looking actually. So yeah, MIT license as usual, quite nice to see that as well. All right, next thing we got is number flip. Um, yeah, it's it's silly, but you know, maybe you need that. You can increase your numbers with uh, flipping animation. It looks like this. There you go. <laughs> Very simple shuffle the slot. And uh, yeah, it can apparently it can uh, spin or flip not just numbers, but anything else. So seems to be quite nice. Okay, next thing we got is x MySQL uh, commands to generate rest APIs for any MySQL database uh, was featured on product hunt. And I actually gained quite a lot of um, quite a lot of upvotes, I believe, seems to be quite, quite cool. So you literally just uh, run the command against MySQL database, and it will generate the rest API for you by figuring out the uh, data structure tables and all that kind of stuff, uh, which is I mean, I guess it's more or less straightforward for the uh, SQL databases, right? Because you have a limited number of things you can do post put delete get and patch. And it seems to generate that for all the tables, bulk IDs and so on and so forth. So um, seems to be pretty straightforward, and I guess works quite well. So maybe you needed that Do have a look. Right next thing we got is gravity. Um, something that people asked about uh, in my last development stream where uh, like how do how do you get link previews and uh, Twitter cards and so on and so forth. So this is one of the ways it uses the open graph and Twitter cards uh, metadata to generate the preview from link, including title description and image. So if you don't if you wanted to do those previews, if you don't want to do it manually, then this library is for you uh, seems to generate just about all you can want from the meta text. Okay. And uh, finally, we got the silly stuff. I th think this joke is amazing. I mean, if you don't play video games, probably won't be as fun for you. But if you do, then Microsoft announces Battle Royale mode for Visual Studio 2019. I find this absolutely hilarious. And I would actually play Battle Royale mode for Visual Studio 2019. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> All right, that's basically it from my side, all the news for today or for this week, I guess. Um, let me have a look in the chat. So complete noob to JavaScript and all object oriented programming could keep my code clean. I want to use a mouse manager class from which I can get all mouse events cords. So I need to grab the mouse cords from the mouse object I made. But I have no idea how to do that. Um, it's like it's really hard to say without seeing your code. Um, I like why, um, like, it's really hard to give advices without knowing anything about the code or the app you're building mate. So I would be more than happy to give you advice. And you are more than welcome to join our discord server where there's more than just me uh, who will be able to help you and who will be able to provide advice. But without seeing the code, I can't really tell anything specific. Although you know, if you if you create a class, then it means you instantiate it. And because this class manages it, I guess it stores those coordinates somewhere in in the instance, right? So you probably can get it through the instance properties, I'm guessing. I don't know. <laughs> Show me your code and I will tell you more. But yeah, um, I think that's basically it for today, unless you guys uh, where where can you, let me try again. Okay. Um, Right. So send your questions to the chat. Uh, once the questions run out, we can stop the stream. So that's it from my side as already said, let me have a look at the questions. Better question, where can I best find help like this? I would say Stack Overflow would be the best place likely. Uh, there is first of all, search, 
If you don't find anything, any answers like this, then ask your own question. Uh, second of all, come to our Discord. As I said, I will be more than happy and there's like other people who will be more than happy to help you there. Any tips on testing React applications? Um, I mean, to do have a look for, uh, like first of all, read through the tutorials on testing in general. Like what you wanna test is, is your component works as expected, right? So does it renders correctly? Does it, does the functions that you expect it to do? Does it changes in the way you expect it to change? And does it uh, triggers all the callbacks or whatever you assign to it, right? So this is like the very basic uh, thing. But I think React, I, I believe React testing, yeah. So they, the Jest has a pretty good tutorial and all of that stuff actually. So maybe you could start by looking at that and uh, going from there. But uh, I mean, essentially just test for what you wanna know that, you know, when you build something, you write tests to make sure that it works the way you expect it to, right? So this is what you wanna test for. If you build a button, you will have to test that, okay, first of all, it renders as a button. Second of all, if you click it, that it actually triggers the action. That's it. It's like, there's no need to overthink it. Just test for what you want it to, uh, you want it to, to do, right? So this, like, this is the, I guess this is the simplest advice I could give in this case. Your choice for creating UIs. My choice is definitely like, okay, um, let me put it this way. Um, so the question is my choice for creating UIs, view or React. If it's a simple, tiny demo that has to just show off some stupid user interface for some very complicated backend, and I have to like do it in one evening or something, then I will take view because it's easier and I don't have to set up anything. If it's more or less complex app with a lot of pages, states, and so on and so forth, I will take React just because I like React more. That's it. <laughs> Hope that answers it. All right. Um, yeah. So if you guys have any other questions, do send them over. If not, we are basically done here for today. There was a pretty lengthy stream, but we talked about all the cool things and uh, not so cool things as well. But uh, yes, as usual, you can find all the links on uh, GitHub under BXGS Weekly. This was episode 16. Do feel free uh, to send me your projects, the links that I might have missed, or the cool things that you want me to talk about on this podcast. I will be more than happy to do this, especially if it was the libraries that you build on your own or the project that you build on your own. Always more than happy to cover that. Um, yeah, it seems like there's no more questions. So let's wrap this up, I guess. Um, let me do this. There we go. So this was BXS Weekly, episode 16. Thank you for watching. I hope you will have an awesome Sunday evening or maybe it's Sunday morning or maybe it's already Monday morning. I don't know where you're watching this. If you're watching this on YouTube, feel free to ask your questions in the comments. Thank you for watching and um, I see you next week. Bye.